Welcome to ARVN, Amateur Radio Video News. The program you're about to see is free to watch, courtesy of YouTube. Thanks, YouTube. But it wasn't free to make. ARVN's got a lot of money invested in video equipment like this sweet camera and that editing system back there. And it takes a lot of time to shoot and edit a program like this. So I'm asking you to make a voluntary payment, contribution, whatever you want to call it. Just stop by our website, arvn.tv, and you'll see a link to make that payment, whatever you think the program is worth to you. I guess you could say that this program is brought to you by you. So thanks for watching and enjoy the show. We're ready now to get started with our talks. I'd like to introduce Kurt Bartholomew, N3GQ. Now, this is a real treat because Kurt works at our favorite commission, and he is the Senior Emergency and Continuity Manager at the Federal Communications Commission. And he's going to be talking to us about catastrophic communications. That's pretty, um, that's pretty dire. Yeah, catastrophic communications, which digital emission type would you use? Take it away, Kurt. Thank you, Steve. Is the audio OK? And thank you for the warm introduction. I really appreciate it. Thank you for Tapper and Digital Communications Conference for inviting us here this year. Um, as the slide indicates, we're going to talk about a little bit about catastrophic communications. But what I'd like to ask you first is this question. Put you in the right frame of mind. Something to think about. Okay, this is what we're going to talk about in this briefing. It moves around a little bit because there's several little topics we like to talk about. But uh, we'll talk about the organization chart as usual. We'll talk about devolution exercises the federal government just did. We'll talk about a survey we're working on, preparedness, a question that we'd like to ask you, 9-11, and then what uh, the FEMA administrator said about amateur radio. Just to give you an idea about my background, just a little bit. I got 41 years in amateur radio. I had a career in the US Army as an intelligence officer and three combat tours. And over the last 18 years or so, I've worked at five federal agencies. They just kept firing me, so. Um, <laughs> Department of State as a watch commander, the Federal Protective Service as a police officer, FEMA headquarters as a, an expert in continuity in government <clears throat> and continuity of operations, the Department of Homeland Security's Office of Intelligence and Analysis, when well, we, st we started that, it's a new agency, also continuity government. And then for the past three years, the Federal Communications Commission as its senior emergency and continuity manager in a new bureau. So first we'll talk about organization. Only three slides, won't take too long. The creation of our bureau as a mandate in section one of the Communications Act that says, we need to promote the safety of life and property through the use of communication services. And our role is to ensure a robust and reliable public safety communication system and effective communications during and after emergencies. And when that bureau was formed, as you can see in the chart, it consisted of elements of several bureaus, enforcement, wireless, wireline, media, the Office of uh, Engineering Technology, Strategic Plans and Policies, and the Office of Managing Director. So we stole from just about everywhere we could to get started. This is the bureau that I'm in, and in the middle of it, you'll see the division that I work in. And we started about three years ago. It's kind of an interesting story. Um, some folks were wondering why the FCC was calling FCC licensees during emergencies and disasters. We would call local offices, counties, state level, asking them, do you need help? And they thought, well, why are they calling me? Did I do something wrong? No, we don't know if you need any help. So initially they would all say no, but eventually they asked us for help, which is nice. Um, we manage the uh, all hazardous emergency preparedness and response actions for the, for the agency. And we also operate a uh, high frequency direction finding center and an operations center that works 24 seven. The, um, and our staff comes from several disciplines, as you might imagine. And my specific area is continuity of government, continuity of operations, and pandemic planning, everything that goes along with emergencies. And that's it 
for the org chart. The next thing we want to talk about is, for the first time, amateur radio for emergency communications was included in the nation's annual federal continuity exercise. First time. This was a scenario that we used. And in this scenario, there's a catastrophic event that causes your agency headquarters and the personnel to be unavailable for work. Now, what could cause that to happen? Well, some people think that was a good thing. <laughs> so here's one possibility. This was the catastrophic event that we used for the exercise. During the exercise scenario, we included all these things that were down. Cell towers, central office switching systems, the internet, cable networks, TV and radio stations, and some satellite connectivity was down for the exercise. So it's just about everything. <clears throat> the Haiti earthquake provides us an example of the devastation we simulated in the exercise. Ditto with the Japanese tsunami. Um, after Hurricane Katrina, you may not be aware of this, part of the National Finance Center, located in Louisiana, had to devolve and relocate. And these are the folks who, in, who ensure federal employees get paid. So it, made the, it became personal for us a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> this could happen in this scenario. It could be back to using one horsepower vehicles. And then again, we may be able to get this Flintstone model that comes in kit form. <laughs> Note the Heath kit rig on the dashboard. <laughs> and this is our devolution team. <laughs> OK. Now these are some more scenarios we had to wa walk ourselves through as part of the exercise. And as you can see, there's, there's quite a few things to talk about. Cyber, geometric storms, magnetic storms, excuse me a different kind of nuclear detonation that could be whether it's high or low detonation, natural disasters, chemical and biological attacks. So there's, there's quite a litany of things you can go through in an exercise that could cause a devolution event to occur. Okay, so on this side, not much can be reasonably available for communication in this scenario. And as you can see, we have a lot of wireless that would normally be available but it's probably not going to be available. Your cell phone won't work, your landline won't work, internet, cable, TV, radio, and most satellite would not work in this scenario. So that was a tough, a tough thing to happen. <clears throat> so what's the connection with us? You may get a call for help in such a dire scenario. As an example, in the September QST magazine, you may have seen an interesting article regarding how a single operator can provide HF email service to three hospital emergency operations centers. The name of the article was Optimizing Amateur Radio Resources for Major Disasters. Very fascinating article and very timely for the exercise that we had. Okay, moving on to another topic. The reason we're developing this uh, survey is because we don't have much data regarding amateur radio use of various emission types in emergencies. The level of emergency communications training, the ability to deploy on little notice, the available skill sets and knowledge base and other, other questions that we have. We receive a lot of calls, especially me, asking us for this information, even just for our opinion, but we are not able to answer them. And a survey would help us a lot in other agencies to at least obtain some useful anecdotal information, if nothing else. As an example, while it's incumbent for each of us to obtain all the necessary specialized training that we would need and knowledge to be effective in emergency we don't have any knowledge of records of this even occurring on a national basis, although we know it's happening. We don't have any, any records, any data, whether it's anecdotal or, or uh, empirical. So today, as you know, many amateur radio operators provide for the transport of messages, but the ham operator himself may not necessarily be the person behind the message origination or even directly involved with the delivery of that message. We often only provide the layer or pathway for the transport of messages from our served agencies. An interesting difference from times past. <clears throat> and again, licensed volunteer communicators are usually not required to show their ability to set up and skillfully operate communications equipment to a standard for emergency communications. We don't have that. 
We don't even have anecdotal information that this is or is not occurring on a national, nationwide basis. So once again, we don't have much information on what amateur radio operators do in emergencies. And of course, exacerbating the situation, exacerbating, I should say, this situation is a lack of national standards and guidance. There is some out there, but it's not necessarily standards. And we don't have any standards, for sure, on digital communications, which is why you all are here. This is needed because agencies like the American Red Cross or hospitals may need us to use a transmission mode that offers some level of accuracy and at least a modicum of security in case they need to communicate data known as personally identifiable information, PII, or to conform with the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA Act, which you may have heard of. It would be very useful for us to know what the emergency communications community thinks about this issue in particular. So while we're waiting for some kind of consensus on the digital issues, packet radio still seems to be the most common digital mode used for emergency communications. However, packet radio messages, messages are often limited to local or within the state for delivery. Unfortunately, even packet radio, which is about two decades old, maybe longer, it seems to have few practitioners available for emergency communication service today. So what is the experience and counsel from you regarding issues associated with increasing the baud or symbol rate on the HF bands without increasing the bandwidth? While we have NATO standardization agreements, stain eggs that are used for the military for communication standards, there are restrictions for their use in the associated equipment in the amateur radio bands, as you all know such as the low 300 baud symbol rate and the high modem costs that are associated with that. So, the volunteer emergency communications mission demands that we continue development of standards for emergency communication skills needed by our volunteer responders. It's needed to help every town prepare to respond to emergency disasters and catastrophes, and it minimizes the effects of disasters and emergencies through better communications preparedness. And as you see on this slide, these are some more reasons why we would like to know if guidance is needed by the emergency communicators, communications community in order to accomplish all these things. <clears throat> NIMS compliance at the national level, response standards, the instant command system, mutual aid initiatives, credentialing, and interoperability, very important. Now we're changing subjects again. We're talking about preparedness. Here are a few questions we can ask ourselves before an emergency hits us again. Is your goal kit ready? Do you have a portable HF Envis antenna? Which digital emission type will you use to support hospitals? Are you proficient in message and traffic handling? Are your spare batteries charged? Do your repeaters have backup power? and on and on and on. So are we prepared for tomorrow? Well, how often has a major weather or other emergency event hit your area? Once every five years, 12 years? Not very often. Small emergencies tend to help us prepare for larger ones. But the ubiquitous and generally resilient nature of modern wireless communication networks are increasingly affording us fewer opportunities to train because the smaller emergencies are repaired relatively quickly, maybe within hours, and in many cases, circuits are routed around the problem area. Some of you will recall when the amateur radio operators were the only folks who could get a phone call while mobile or away from a landline phone. Our repeater auto patch capability was a lifesaver in those days, and it still is in many parts of the community where ubiquitous cell phones coverage is not available. How many of you know how long the UPS system works on a cell tower, on average? Four hours. That's how much time you've got, or they've got, to get someone out to the cell tower to fix it, bring out a colt or a cow, cells on wheels, cells on light trucks, or do something to get the connectivity back or increased for cell usage. Four hours. That's our window of opportunity to jump in and say, where can we help? We need to think twice before we ignore local talent that doesn't fit into our plan. The plan has to be flexible so we can fit the available resources and skill sets into the plan.
For example, in the U.S. Army Reserves, the unit is brought to the location where the people are living, not the people to the unit. Likewise, you can train them to increase their skill sets, but you can't move them to another county or state. So in emergency communications, you may have somebody available who only works CW. That's at 25 words a minute. How do you fit him in? You may not be able to have anyone in your area who's ready to use digital emission types and modes like WinLake 2000, MultiPSK, MixW, Packet, or MBEMS. However, you might have a ham who knows his way around DigiPan, has a nice satellite set up, has a good single sideband VHF capability, and a similarly outfitted VHF buddy in the neighboring county. Or a ham who just happens to send copy CW at 20 words a minute and regularly checks into a net. So let's not ignore the local talent that does not fit into the plans. This is an interesting uh, subject that uh, really applies to this, this group more than probably anything else. You know, in the commercial sectors where organizations pay for their spectrum, there is significant economic incentive to use the resource efficiently and to spread the cost over as many years and many users as possible while maintaining good quality of service. That is, there's a strong incentive to develop and adopt more spectrally efficient technology. For example, by adopting various digital techniques, commercial mobile radio service providers like Seller and PCS have been able to dramatically increase their capacity compared to the original analog technology. So in the past, comparing to HAMS, we have adopted more spectrally efficient technologies too. For example, we migrated from double sideband, I'll bet it was a year ago, a while ago, amplitude modulation to single sideband modulation. And we need to continue shifting towards more spectrally efficient communications, especially digital. And of course, we went to um, teletype modes. But we need to go do a little, keep shifting to more spectrally efficient techniques because there's many benefits. First, you will demonstrate to policymakers and regulators that you are good stewards of the public's airwaves even without economic incentives. And second, by using what you have efficiently, it strengthens your case when you need to ask for additional spectrum or just even keep your own spectrum. Third, by allowing more users to access the available allocations simultaneously, it improves the amateur experience and ultimately increases the attractiveness of the service to the new and the old alike. Fourth, it provides the opportunity or headroom for increases in data rates to more closely match those available on wireline networks and in the future on commercial wireless networks as well. And finally, as the rest of the telecommunications world makes a transition to digital techniques, and there are very few exceptions to that, the amateur service will look antiquated if it is not making progress in that direction as well. So looking into the future of the amateur radio service in this century, it is to our advantage to continue our traditional roles in public service by preparing ourselves for and providing communications in times of emergencies, conducting experiments, providing training in radio communications, and encouraging international goodwill. But it would be particularly beneficial if we focus attention, for the reason I just mentioned, on experimentation with digital techniques that are capable of squeezing more bits per second per hertz of bandwidth and out of the increasingly valuable radio spectrum. By the way, this presentation, this part of the presentation, in large part came from a gentleman named Dale Hatfield, W0IFO, who used to be the chief of the Office of Engineering Technology at the FCC in 2000. So you can see, 11 years ago, what he said still applies today. Okay, 2001, 2005, 2009, 2010, 2011. It's not like we won't be needed again. We will. We have good emergency communications courses and books that tell us how to behave and with whom to coordinate. But we still need to arrive at a consensus of what specific emission types and modes to use in an emergency to ensure immediate interoperability when we need it the most. Collectively, we have been unable to solve this issue. And in my humble opinion, it's because our, there's no national level organization or agency that has stepped up to the plate to fully work this issue. We cannot expect the ARRL to do everything for us. They don't have the funding. So why hasn't the federal government offered to help? Well, one of its challenges is that Congress has decreed 
that the Federal Communications Mission will be divided amongst at least five agencies. Those agencies are the FCC, the oldest, followed by NTIA, Department of Homeland Security, National Communications System. Is Steve Carty here? There he is. And FEMA, DEC, Disaster Emergency Communications, and Department of Homeland Security, Office of Emergency Communications, Ross Merlin. So here you have five agencies, as a minimum, working on a similar, very similar mission where they overlap. Is there a wonder why we can't come to consensus on things? <clears throat> so if we can get our collective arms around the issues and discuss them, both anecdotal and empirical data, we should be able to formulate a consensus where we can base some useful national response guidance. That would be very useful. You know, there are as many opinions as there are hams. We all know that. <laughs> but it's important to note that our goal is not to dictate anything to anyone. The point is that when you show up somewhere to get help, help get the message out, you will want to do so quickly and with the assurance that you are using a mission type compatible with that of your intended message recipient. And a good way to accomplish that is to agree on the protocols before the next serious event hits us. As I recall, Noah built the ark before it rained. <laughs> When communication systems fail and we are called upon to help it or to provide a surge capability, expediency requires that we all be on the same sheet of music upon arrival. So we'd like to know your answer to the following important question. There's my email address on this slide. Please send me a comment if you, or anything. So just to recap, if you had to send a message to someone else, an important message, and it had to get there, no ifs, ands, or buts, accurately using HF, ARQ, automatic repeat request, what would you use? Lots of choices. Okay, 9-11. Oh, I didn't? Should I go back? I got a long name. <laughs> it comes in the end. On 9-11, we saw civilians, many of them amateur radio operators, together with our fire, police, EMTs, and other first responders running to help at the burning Trade Center Towers, the Pentagon, Flight 93, Pennsylvania, many sacrificing their own lives while saving others. You probably remember where you were on 9-11. Good chance. I was in IS-89, 100 yards from the tower. There we go. I was at FEMA headquarters. Not a good place to be at the time. Um, but we are stronger than we were a decade ago. And our resilience has enabled us to make progress on every front to protect our families and prepare ourselves for emergencies. While the days have turned to years, we have not, and we will not, ever forget the price we paid and the many heroes who gave the ultimate sacrifice. We must continuously ensure that we will be kept safe by men and women who are strong, smart, adaptive, and ever vigilant. Okay, so, so what does that have to do with us here? This is, after all, an annual digital communications conference. Well, after 9-11, due to my experience at FEMA headquarters, my focus in amateur radio turned to emergency communications, as you might have imagined. The hobby is great fun, but we should never ignore the serious side of amateur radio. It doesn't take that much effort to be prepared for an emergency. How should we communicate and be interoperable in a digital environment when the commercial networks are seriously overloaded or unavailable? You are probably the best audience who can answer this question because you represent the backup to the backup in digital amateur radio capability and its brain trust. So let's continue to pursue Solutions to our digital dilemmas. Let's look to the future and rejoice in the knowledge that, among all the blessings we share across this great land of ours, that we will always stand tall and freedom will always ring loud and clear. The FCC hosted an earthquake communications preparedness forum on 3 May, which I attended. During that forum, the administrator from FEMA, Craig Fugate, praised amateur radio operators for their provision of emergency communication in the aftermath of earthquakes, tsunamis, and hurricanes. This is the first known recent praise of amateur radio operators from his level at FEMA. 
And what I did was I transcribed a quote from the video record, and I will try to sound like him as best I can. So, I want to hit on four broad areas. <laughs> because we talk about communications, and we talk about the public. Oftentimes, I almost get a sense that we pit one against the other in how we describe things. I think we talk a lot about social media at the expense of the broadcasters. I think we talk a lot about public safety communications, but then we come back to broadband. And then there's one group that we never talk about, but they're the ultimate backups. And they were the originators of what we call social media. And that's the amateur radio operators. Ten minutes later, Administrator Fugate said, and then finally, I have got to come back to amateur radio. The initial communications out of Haiti and some of the communications that we go back and forth across these disasters is from volunteers using assigned frequencies that they are allocated, their own equipment, their own money, nobody pays them. They were the first ones oftentimes getting the word out in the critical first hours and first days as the rest of the systems came back up. And I think there is a tendency that because we have done so much to build infrastructure and resiliency in all of our other systems, we have tended to dismiss that role. When everything else fails, amateur radio is oftentimes our last line of defense. And I think at times we get so sophisticated and we have gotten so used to the reliability and resilience of our wireless and wired systems and our broadcast industry and all of our public safety communications that we can never phantom that they'll fail. They do, they have, they will. And I think a strong amateur radio community that's plugged into these plans is needed. Yeah, most of the time they're gonna be bored because there's not much they can do that people aren't doing with Twitter and Facebook and everything else. But when you need amateur radio, you really need them. The FCC thanks you for your considered service, continued service. <clears throat> and of course, thank you for listening because otherwise I'll be talking to myself. Again, and if you have any questions, I think we have, yeah, we have some time. Please fire away. Yeah, uh, the, uh, one of the things that uh, struck me was the, uh, in, um, talking about uh, utilizing the bandwidth more effectively, and uh, has your office had given any thought to the fact that part of the problem with that is that the amateur radio operator is has a tremendous number of regulations on some of the frequencies so that utilizing the bandwidth to uh, more efficiently is not uh, you know really not possible and some people now I understand are uh, trying to get a regulation passed where the bands and so forth are defined by the bandwidth rather than, you know, RTTY or whatever the mode and, and so forth is typically now. Right. And are they, are they approaching this at all to, uh, to try to change that? Let me give you a little background on what you just said so that you understand um, where the FCC is looking at at this time. At the FCC headquarters, you have one person in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, Bill Cross, who works probably 90% of all the issues for amateur radio by himself. You have the Enforcement Bureau, Laura Smith, who does the enforcement actions up in Gettysburg. Then you have me, who works emergency comms whenever I get a chance to do it, because I have another job I've got to get done. So you don't have a lot of people working amateur radio issues at headquarters. They're mostly concerned, as you might imagine, with the telecommunications uh, companies and lots of other things, Light Squared, you name it, there's all kinds of issues that they're working on. But when it comes to amateur radio, what normally happens, and what I've been told from people who work there forever, is that when you write us, we have to look at what you send us. And we try to respond when we can, but the important thing is your input. It's very rare for a federal employee with an FCC to initiate something, say, we ought to do this. Good example is the HF, you know, symbol rate. It's kind of slow, kind of you know, compared to what you can do today, and you can not, you can speed it up without increasing your bandwidth, and you can look at systems like Winlink as an example that use it very efficiently, and there are others obviously, 
But the point is, is that if you want to see something work better, or if you want to change the rules, more importantly, that's the way to do it. As you probably know, NTIA, National Telecommunications Information Agency, it, it has its own rules, but they are nowhere near as, where I'm looking for, regulatory as ours. Because, as an example, who, how many of you here work Mars or have worked Mars in the past? See? How many rules do you have in Mars when it comes to mission types and things like that? Not a whole lot, right? That's an advantage that Mars has that amateur radio doesn't have. I find it interesting that you have to have a license, an amateur radio license, for the FCC to work in an NCIA frequency. That's interesting. But having said that, since Mars has already proven what can be done, you can take some of that and say, hey, FCC, how about looking at this for us? And we'll look at it. But I have to say, if you want to get stuff done at that headquarters, you really got to send us something through the system that they have set up, which admittedly is bureaucratic, but that's the way it operates, and we're not going to change that part of it. And the ARRL does a great job with that. They really do. But you can be part of that process. Any single ham can send something in. Write it well, and I would recommend when you write something to the FCC, not only make it detailed, but make it in as plain language as possible. The reason I say that is not everybody's an engineer there. We have a lot of attorneys who do not have a telecommunications background. So you've got to explain some things in some detail. I'll just leave it at that. Sir. I, I wanted to say something about the regulatory issues. I think that the problem really is that amateur radio is self-regulating and indeed amateur radio is self-over-regulating. Uh, for example, we prolonged Morse code testing for a great long time to prevent getting all the CBers into amateur radio. Well, I don't see them. So um, is there something that you can do as a public service client of amateur radio to give us the message more strongly that we are self-over-regulating in a way that hurts our public service mission. To do that, once again, it has to be done in writing. They listen to what's done in writing. You can call me on the phone all day long, call everybody else on the phone and, and say, this is messed up. That's not gonna, really going to help a lot. You have to write something in an art, articulate fashion that is understandable and say, hey, look, we got a public safety meeting, a mission here. We're trying to help. And we got a, some stuff that's hurting us or stopping us from doing certain things. Work, work can you do to help us out? But don't forget, this is a hobby also. Yeah, we have a serious side, emergency comms that I'm working. But remember, you got DXers, you got you know, international goodwill. There's a lot of things associated with amateur radio, that, as you know. That's why you have a special conference like this one just for digital. It's great. So we can't always concentrate on one thing, but I will say this, my, just my personal opinion, MCOM is what saves amateur radio from losing spectrum and even maybe gaining some because the public has to see the benefit. We are holding on to billions and billions of, of spectrum that we're using for our hobby. What's the public getting out of this? And when you do go out and serve the public, are you telling the media about it? You have a PR guy you can go to and say, hey, how about writing something up for the paper or the, or the TV station or the, or the radio? Do we do that very well? No, we don't. We, all, we go out, we help them out, and we go home. And no one knows that we did anything. That's really important. It really is because the public needs to know that, yes, we're still here. No, we're not just Morse code guys. We do other stuff. And that's not the only digital mode, by the way. We do a lot of good stuff for the public, and that needs to be broadcast. To everybody. Um, did I answer your question? I don't think I did. did yes, I? thank you, sir. Okay. Hi. Sir. Yeah, I had a question. Uh, you know, I, I know a lot of what you've discussed is focused on spectrum and spectral efficiency, but I think one of the biggest challenges we're running into in amateur radio now is um, it, it's relatively easy to come in with a handheld or a mobile rig in your car and set up something. But um, you know, to really make amateur radio effective, I think for emergency comms, 
um, having multiple sites, repeaters, you know, on decent locations that can be hit um, is still one of the most valuable uh, means of access of that spectrum. And it's becoming increasingly difficult, in, especially in the metropolitan areas, to find decent locations to put up repeaters, to put up and preposition antennas. And we're constantly running into the case now where you know, if you walk up to a municipality and say, we would like to put an, an amateur radio antenna at our own cost on your water tower, and they'll say, uh, thank you, that'll be $1,000 a month. Um, they are really not receptive to that. They're looking for any way they can to sell this piece of real estate. Right. And um, this is probably gonna be one of the, the biggest issues. This is actually something I wanted to kind of address with the D-Star stuff later, but you know, it, finding decent locations and the willingness of, you know, either public service towers or other commercial buildings or, you know, you name it, but just finding um, somebody willing to host us, even if we're paying for our own equipment, even if they ask us to pay for our own electricity, you know, and or, uh, you know, a, a, an internet connection or whatever, it's just, you know, it, that's probably the one area I think the government could probably try and help out in some ways is at least encouraging people to make some of their prime real estate available for the amateur community. Very good point. I'd like to add to what you said that, um, in my opinion, the single most important skill you can have is people skills. Why do I say that? Because at the local level, which is where all emergencies are, who are you going to deal with? Your fire chief? Sheriff, two primary guys, right? Okay, if you can't get along with those two guys, you're probably not gonna get anything. But if you get along with them, you will get tower space. And I'll just use my county as, as an example. Six years ago, I became the ECRO for my county. And we had, at that time, we actually had 23 guys on our team. We started out with four just a few years earlier. We now have 62. We have tower space on three towers, the tallest towers in the county. We're waiting for our D-Star, second D-Star um, stack to get uh, put on the second tower. And we have lots of plans for future. And, they, and they have, we have backup generator support, battery support, solar. We have everything you can think of supported by the county, and now they want to buy us radios. It used to be just the other way around. You're who? What can you do for us? No, we'll talk to you later. But the, what caused that to happen was so just a handful of us got to get to know the fire chief and, this, and the sheriff, those two key guys, and the emergency manager now. If you have an emergency manager, if you don't have one, you should find out who he is. Because by NIMS, ICS, every locality is required to have an emergency manager. And that guy could be anyone. He could work for the fire chief, assistant chief. He could work for the sheriff's department. He could work for EMS. Depends on how you're organized, because every county is a little bit different, every parish, whatever. But, having said that, that relationship is key. It's key to amateur radio, it's key to emergency communications, it's key to the future of us because without that relationship, you're not gonna get anything. We, got, we have free tower space. We even have free climbers go put up our hard line and our antennas for us. That's great. You, can you beat that? I mean, free equipment? Everything, the whole nine yards, electricity, all that. We, only thing we pay for as a club, I would say, is some of the equipment, the repeater system, as an example, and we maintain it. But that's the bottom line to getting this done, is relationships. You gotta build relationships. And if there's one thing that I've seen across the nation in that re regard is that we have some guys, it only takes one guy, really, to mess up the entire system in your area, one guy. That's all it takes. So you gotta get a hold of that one guy and say, hey, let me talk to you. In fact, I'll give you an example. When I was, when I was before I went to FEMA, I was a police officer with the Federal Protective Service, and we had to provide law enforcement for FEMA and disaster relief sites. And I came to one place in North Carolina, and I forget this. I get there, and I'm talking to the fire chief and the, uh, the sheriff, and they said, hey, you see that guy in the corner over there? That guy over there, the large guy? Yeah. And you go talk to him because I was about to arrest him. He's being belligerent. He says he knows everything, and we just need to get him out of here. So I went to the back of the room, talked to the guy, and I, I read him the riot act because I had my uniform on. I looked very, you know, 
intimidating. And I said, what are you doing? What are you doing here? She says, I'm a ham. And these guys don't know what they're doing. <laughs> and I said, you're a ham? She said, you know what? I'm a ham, too. And that really bothers me, what you just said. I'll tell you what. I want you to leave now and come back in three hours. And I'll decide whether I'm going to arrest you or not. Because you just violated several federal laws. OK, so he comes back three hours later. He's calmed down. And we, we talk about stuff at length. I'm trying to help this guy out a little bit and his community. That's one guy, one guy. Just an example of where you got to find that one guy and say, hey, let's get along. Let's get this stuff done. Because you alone can mess everything up for all of us. So let's get along. Sorry about that. The relationship between the FCC and the AWRL, is it, let's say, the guys in this room, we've, we've got an issue we want the FCC to bring up. Is it better for us to write 100 letters to the AWRL and have the AWRL go to the FCC and say, we've got 100 guys that have got this issue? Or is it better to have 100 guys write a letter directly to the FCC and tell the AWRL we did it? Or how does that work? What, what is the relationship between the FCC and the AWRL? It's funny you should mention that, because um, one of the things that we deal with at FCC is what, what they call conflict of interest. And it seems because you've got a building full of lawyers, everything's a conflict of interest. <laughs> um, as an example, um, when I first got there, uh, we had the Kentucky ice storms. And that's the main reason I'm still there is because of the Kentucky ice storms, by the way. Let me tell you a quick story. Um, over 60 counties out of 80 were under ice. And the telcos couldn't get their Colts on wheels, I mean, cells on wheels, cells on uh, light trucks. They couldn't get them in there. They couldn't get their big 18-wheelers in there because the roads were all trees and all that. So we called all the counties. And... Um, I remember one conversation in particular, uh, we asked him, well, how'd you, how'd you eventually get your comms, the first comms you got? And this guy says, well, I got a hold of the sheriff. Sheriff's got a deputy, got a chainsaw. We had this ham we had to go pick up. Got to his house, brought him in, and he got fired up his radio. He talked to the county next to us in the state. And I said, that's it? You only needed one circuit? He says, yeah, that's all we needed. And it was great. Guy, guy was a lifesaver. Now, that didn't get out. That was not in any of the media anywhere, what that guy did. Why not? Why not? But to answer your question more directly, um, where would I write to? I'd write to both of them. If I'm a member of AWL, well, I'm going to write to them and I'd say, hey, can you help me out? This is what I think we need. And I'd write the FCC too. Who you get an answer from, it's hard to say. But I will say this about AWRL, which is interesting. Um, when I first got there, I was said, well, you can't talk to them because, you know, they're licensees, and we're regulators. I said, okay, fine. So, I don't know, about a year later, my bureau chief came to me and said, can you be the liaison to AWRL? I need someone. I said, wait a minute, didn't you just talk to me last year about saying no? Yeah, but you now we need help. So, it changes sometimes, you know, what's conflict of interest and what isn't. But it's something we always have to look at when we, we talk, when we answer questions, when we do things. You have to look at the two hats that we wear, you know. And uh, I guess I'm a little pro-amateur radio. And we really appreciate that a heck of a lot, Kirk. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. <laughs>